Okay, folks, good afternoon to everybody. Can we please take, take our seats for those of you who haven't yet done so? Come on, guys, sit down, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who I have not met, which is the overwhelming majority, very pleased to meet you. I'm Tim Abram. I'm a nuclear guy by background, so those of you who elected to do anything to do with nuclear engineering have already met me. Those of you who haven't, this is me. This is me. I'm very, very pleased to meet you guys. You all still got good, happy memories of the summer vacation? Yeah? All feeling good? Let's see what we can do to, to fix that, shall we? Um, it's very nice to see so many of you here. I, I truly hope that we continue this level of attendance all the way through the module. Um, we all know that you won't. We all know that by, by December I will be addressing about 100 people if I'm lucky. But nevertheless, um, I really hope you all continue to come. Um, not least because I have an appallingly bad habit which I've developed over many years. Um, it's not good. I don't, I don't feel particularly proud of it, but I actually would like you to pass your exams, okay? And I have discovered that if during the course of our lectures I drop really broad and obvious hints as to what your exam questions are going to be in January, you have a much better chance of passing, it turns out. There is, however, a problem with that strategy. The school and the department would be greatly exercised if they found out that I was giving you hints for what exams might be coming up. And please remember that every word I say during these lectures will be recorded and could be used as evidence against me. Um, whilst losing my job might occasionally seem quite attractive, not at the moment, but come January when I've got 400 exam scripts to mark, yeah, actually, that might not be such a bad outcome. However, I've got a mortgage to pay, so it's not a viable option. So I have discovered that one way round the problem, bearing in mind that every word I say is being recorded, is that when a subject comes up that I think might be of particular interest to you, as regards January and examinations, I gesticulate wildly and point your direction towards what I think you might want to learn. If you are here in the lecture theatre, all of that will be painfully obvious to you. If you are sat listening to the recording on Blackboard, you will have absolutely no idea. So there is at least one good reason for carrying on turning up to the lectures. I know it will be difficult. I'm very, very well aware of the pressures that will build on you, particularly in your third year. A long, long time ago, way, way back in the last century, I was not quite literally sat where you're sitting, but metaphorically at least, I did mechanical engineering at Manchester as well. I know how rubbish things get. And the third year is particularly demanding. If you get through this year, and you will, but when you get through this year, you will have deserved it. It is a really tough year. Those of you enrolled on the four-year program will find the fourth year much easier. That's little comfort to you this year, but either way, those who are escaping or those who are joining us again for a fourth year, life will become very much easier next year. This year is a challenge. I absolutely accept that. Um, I have tried not to make this unit add unrealistically to the extra amount of work that you've got coming, okay. Um, 
just by way of introduction, I will go trot through the slides in a, in a moment. Um, just by way of introduction for what's coming this afternoon, by the way, this is a fairly light introduction to the subject. I don't think we'll need our two hours. We might be okay. We probably will need an hour, maybe a little bit more. After that, we can all be released back into the wild. Normally, my preferred option for a normal duration lecture is to offer you a choice. Um, and it's entirely up to you. There are basically two ways we can go. We can award ourselves a break in the middle. Everybody likes a break in the middle, but that means we'll take up most of the lecture period. Or we can just put our heads down, power on through, and hopefully be released a little bit earlier. I have no idea what your preference is, so we shall proceed democratically and put it to the vote every week, okay? Not this week, because hopefully we'll be able to get out of here fairly expeditiously, maybe not quite for four o'clock, but maybe not that far afterwards, okay? All good so far? I haven't actually told you very much, but um, let's begin by telling you a little bit about how we're going to structure the unit and how you will be assessed, even, even before we actually bother telling you what control engineering is. So this is what I'm going to be talking to you about for the next 20 minutes or so. The introduction to the module and the staff is actually really, really quick. Um, okay, so fairly self-evident. The aims are to allow you to develop an understanding of the concepts related to automatic control. What on earth does that mean? Well, we'll dig into that in a few moments. And to demonstrate your competence in the design and analysis, not so much design, actually, mostly analysis of simple control systems. We don't actually differentiate between analog and digital systems. In terms of staff, it's a really, really quick introduction because there's only me. So I will be giving you all of your lectures. I will be setting and marking your coursework, setting and marking your exam. I don't know if this is good news or not to you, but there will be no laboratory sessions associated with this module. Um, we used to run them a couple of years ago. The feedback from students, and actually not that we needed feedback, it was fairly obvious, was that although the labs added a little bit to your understanding, they didn't add very much at all. Um, they were, and I'm paraphrasing here, but to a large extent, they were somewhat of a waste of two or three hours of your time. Okay, it's only two or three hours, but none of us has two or three hours to waste, and in your third year, you definitely don't have two or three hours to waste. So there are no lab sessions associated with this unit, okay? None at all. There is coursework, but there are no labs. So, oh, yeah, before we leave this slide, I ought to say, um, unlike most of the staff in this department or the staff that will teach you in the faculty, I'm located in a kind of a weird building. I'm not in MECD, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> for, fortunately, perhaps, for some of my colleagues. Um, so I'm a nuclear guy. Um, my research group spends its time making interesting compounds out of uranium and testing them. Um, for that reason, they wouldn't let us anywhere near MECD. Uh, we have our own rather secure facilities in an adjacent building called Royce. That's almost by the by, actually. The Royce building doesn't have any teaching facilities. It's entirely a research building. You can get into the ground floor, and that's as far as you can get. And even if you could get up to level seven, which is where I live, you wouldn't be able to get any further because it's guarded by something that resembles a bank vault. Um, it is a, an SR4 security door that is able to withstand a determined attack by a person armed with an angle grinder for at least 40 minutes. So we have some fairly tasty material up there on floor seven. Uh, and your chances of being able to get to me for questions on, a, on control engineering are pretty slim. What so? So, getting hold of me physically, um, how, however much you might want to, is going to prove uh, challenging. So, please take a note of my email address and my phone number. 
You can get me, you can call me any time you like. I might not always be able to pick up because I might be in a meeting or lecturing, but I will get back to you and we can always arrange to meet in MECD or other places, okay? So, the fact that I am physically located in the Royce building is interesting, but actually of no practical significance whatsoever because you won't be able to find me. Um, it's a bit of a shame in previous years when we occupied the North Campus, I was to be found opposite the computer cluster in Paris building, and it was really easy to get at me. Um, those happy days have, have gone, I'm afraid. So, very happy to meet you outside of the lecture space. Absolutely very happy to meet you pretty much any time you like, but we'll have to organize a meeting for that reason. Okay? So, please do get in contact with me if you've got any questions or concerns or anything that you just don't get about the module. Happy to talk to you after the lecture, happy to talk to you any other time, but we'll have to kind of arrange to meet. Either give me a buzz, drop me a text, or email, okay? What else do I have to tell you? Um, okay, delivery arrangements. Okay, the fact that you're all here means that you know where the lecture is going to be held and when it's going to be held. Um, Lecture slots are, well, okay, <laughs> they are lecture slots. They do all of those things, fairly obviously. There are lecture recordings available from previous years. So from those horrible days of COVID when we had to record everything, those lectures are still available to you. They are pretty much still valid. Um, that's not always the case. As we will see much later on, when we go through past examination papers, it's only worth going back so far in time. And the reason for that is that the course contents do change a little bit every year with time. I update them. Some, sometimes I bring in new subjects. Sometimes I drop old subjects. They don't change dramatically from one year to the next, but they do evolve slowly over time. So going back two or three or even four years in terms of past examination papers is probably okay. Going back six or seven or eight years becomes increasingly worrisome um, in, in the context of you may find questions that came in those examinations that leave you scratching your heads and thinking, we haven't covered this material. Yep, you're right. We probably haven't. That was stuff that we've since dropped and we've introduced new topics. Okay? So, Definitely okay to go back three or four, probably even five years. It becomes increasingly perilous to go back any further than that because there's a good chance that the module will have evolved and changed over that time. So, those lectures from the, the horrible days of, of 2020, 2021 are still pretty much valid they probably won't be valid all that much longer, but they're okay for you guys. Um, they're available on the Blackboard portal and the lectures with subtitles. Haven't actually checked the accuracy of those subtitles. They could be quite amusing. Uh, they'll be available on the UNIS video portal. Okay, so for those of you who didn't, um, those of you who are, are asking questions from the audience, that's absolutely great because you don't have the, the advantage of a microphone, not everybody hears what the question was. So the, the question was, and it's one that's already been picked up by email, um, this introductory lecture, lecture, and I think the next one on PID controllers isn't on the portal, that's absolutely true. I didn't bother putting the introductory lecture because there is almost nothing that I say this afternoon that will be examinable. This is just an introduction, okay? So in your exam questions, I'm not going to ask you, where was the control lecture held and on what day of the week and what time, okay? I'm not going to ask you how much of it is examined by examination and how much of it is coursework. So, that kind of administrative stuff is not reproduced on the, uh, on the video lectures. Please. Mm. 
Okay, and, and the part of the lecture that's on PID controllers actually in previous years has occurred much later in the unit. I think lecture eight or nine by, by memory. You might be wondering, and in fact you ought to be wondering, what on earth are PID controllers? Um, all will become clear, I hope, as we move through this afternoon, and particularly when I ta start talking about the coursework, because they are exactly the subject of the coursework that you'll be getting. Okay? So, PID controllers are a subject that is somewhat self-contained. They will make a little more sense when we get to the end of the module, of course, because you will have covered everything, but actually there's no reason at all why we couldn't, and perhaps we will if, if time permits, we couldn't have a discussion on PID controllers this afternoon. And you know what? You would probably get it. In fact, I think you would get pretty much everything that we will discuss on PID controllers. Why would we bring it forward to today when we perhaps could kick it back to the end of the, end of the module? Very simply, your coursework is on that subject. You're going to write me a little report on PID controllers. So I figured that it was probably a good idea to give you at least a heads up, a beginning of a lecture on the subject. You can go away then, do the coursework, and actually probably make an excellent job of it. You won't need all the other lectures that are coming up to do that. And that will allow you to get a piece of coursework, which I think you could probably knock out with two or three evenings work. That will allow you to get that out of the way, get it submitted, and clear the decks for all the other weight of coursework that is going to descend upon you over the next few weeks. Okay? So the coursework assignment for this unit, I think, is already available to you to look at on Blackboard. And you know what? By the time we meet next week, you could easily have done it. I really would strongly, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to rattle it off in the first week, but the earlier you get it out of the way, the much better it will be for you in the context of all the other work you have to do, not just this semester, but next semester. All of you, of course, will have now, by now been notified about your personal projects. Your personal projects are going to take a lot of your time this year. They're really going to sap your time. So the quicker you can get your other coursework out of the way and cleared off, the better it will be for your personal projects. I don't want to play down the importance of other modules, um, certainly not this one, but when you look at how many marks are available to you for your personal project and how many marks are available to you for the coursework element of this module, you should be able to figure out pretty quickly where your attention is best placed in order to maximize the end of year mark. Okay? And if you haven't worked it out already, it's not on your control engineering assignment. Hugely important though that is, there are more marks to be had elsewhere. We all following that? Makes sense? So, definitely do your assignment and by the way, if you're really struggling, if you're struggling for time, remember, it doesn't matter what you send me, it doesn't matter how limited it is in length, how limited it is in quality, if you send me something, I can give it a mark. If you fail to send me anything, my hands are tied, that I can't award a mark for nothing. Even I am not quite that flexible in order to be able to do that. I really hope that none of you find yourself in this position, but we've all been there, we've all been up against it. We know how deadlines have a, a tendency to accumulate as we go through the semester. Please, 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 if you're really, really pushed, you can have a quick word with me and say, look, oh, Tim, a whole bunch of stuff came up, and the dog ate my assignment, and a whole bunch of other things happened. I'm sure I can give you an extra week or so to get things done, but please, please, please submit something. Doesn't matter how incomplete, how far it might fall below your own personal standards that you'd really like to hit, doesn't matter. 
sending me something is way, way better than sending me nothing. At least I can give you some marks, assuming you get your names right. <coughs> Absolutely. So, although I am encouraging you to make a start on your coursework, and I am, by the way, um, it's one of the few bits of coursework that you could actually go home from, from, this eve from this afternoon's lecture and make a start on straight away, and I think you do a very good job, actually, you've obviously got several weeks in order to hand it in. So, if you don't fully understand what is meant, if you don't fully understand what it is I'm looking for, don't despair. We've got plenty of weeks in order to be able to discuss the subject. Okay? So the fact that I'm encouraging you to do it early obviously doesn't mean that you have to submit it by next week or even the week after. You've got plenty of time. It's just that time will run away with you and all those other items of coursework will be catching up with you, okay? No idea. Due at the end of week five. Can't remember when week five is. Okay. Books. Um, you read for a degree, you've all heard that phrase, and we always encourage you to read around your subjects. However, I refer you back to my earlier comments about the lack of time that you guys will have this year. Lots of online material is available on this subject. I've given one or two examples there. There are loads and loads of others. Do you need any of this stuff to pass your examinations? No. Everything you need to pass your exams is in the handouts, is in these course notes that are on Blackboard. Okay? Absolutely everything. Will it improve your understanding and the depth of your knowledge to read around the subject? Yes, of course it will. Do I encourage you to do it? Most certainly. Do you have to do it? No. We understand each other? Perfect. Okay, where are we now? Module assessments, okay, this is very, very simple. Um, it's the usual 80-20 split. In case you were wondering, I'm sure you weren't, but in case you were wondering why we give so much emphasis to examinations and so little emphasis to courseworks, the answer is really, really simple. In order to have our courses accredited by the relevant engineering institutions, so for you guys, that would be the Royal Air to Aeronautical Society and the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Both of those institutions distrust coursework. They think you'll collude or find other ways of cheating. Examinations, on the other hand, they like. They're directly attributable to you. So, whilst it may not be a fair reflection of the real world, and it isn't, examinations, unfortunately, constitute the bulk of the assessment for this project. No, just wait a moment, please. Examinations constitute the bulk of the assessment for this project. So, 80% of the mark for this unit will be examinations, 20% for that coursework. So, figure out the mark for the module, 20% of that is how much you'll get for the coursework. Do the comparison with how much of a mark for the end of year mark your personal project is worth. That will put things into context, okay? So, again, for the, just for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not in any way suggesting that the coursework element is unimportant for this module but it is a question of balance. You have very, very little time available to you this year, and you have, to, uh, you have to achieve a very great deal. So it's all about putting your effort where the greatest reward is to be had. Your personal project is a lot of marks this year. 20% of one module, not so much.
coursework. Yes. All coursework is open book. Yeah. Your examinations are not, obviously. No open book examinations, but coursework, yes. You can draw on as much reference material as you like. Guys, pipe, pipe down, please. You do indeed. Um, <laughs> and you can easily do that like Harvard did. Oh, wait, you can easily use any of a vast variety of online tools to automatically generate Harvard references from links, right? Yes, you can. Uh, well, first of all, you've raised lots and lots of points there. Do you have to get all of your references online? Of course not. We have these old fashioned things called libraries, pretty big one actually, in that direction, and you can search for information in there. I'm well aware that you will all go straight to Google Scholar and start looking there. And actually, I encourage you to do that. So if you look at the coursework assignment, which we perhaps will uh, a little later on, I've given you some guidance notes in the back of that coursework assignment. And I've actually, for once and only once, I have suggested that of all the places to start looking, the Wikipedia page for PID controllers is actually a good place to start, okay? Under no circumstances are you to reference Wikipedia. Why not? That's a very good answer. So, absolutely, Wikipedia is, is an amalgamation of sources. That is absolutely true. But there's an even more fundamental reason why we do not quote Wikipedia. Okay? And that reason is that Wikipedia is a resource that any of us, and anybody you know, anybody that, any random that you meet on the street, can edit the Wikipedia page for that particular subject and there are no constraints on their ability to do that. In other words, it's not a peer-reviewed reference source. There's no quality check with Wikipedia. Anybody and everybody can edit it. That is its fundamental, I won't say it's a problem, it's just the nature of Wikipedia. It doesn't pretend to be anything other than what it is. Happily, for most pages, um, most people don't bother editing them, and a small number of very, very well-intentioned and usually quite well-qualified people are responsible for the content. I have looked at the content for PID controllers this year, as I have in previous years. It's a good place to start, but we can't reference it. So by all means, as you will see, I've done this myself, by all means take visual images, diagrams, pictures from Wikipedia. By all means, use the references that Wikipedia itself cites, but don't cite Wikipedia itself. Remember, it's not a trustworthy source. It's like asking your mate. Your mate might be right, who knows? But they're just your mate. They're not referenceable. Anyway, the point is that Wikipedia, as far as your coursework is concerned, is actually a pretty good place to start. A place to start, I emphasize. It's absolutely not the end of your endeavors, as far as research goes, but it's actually a good place to start. So, if you did nothing else this evening for control engineering, if you get at the Wikipedia page for PID controllers and have a quick read through it, that would be time well spent, because it's a pretty good introduction to the subject. Okay, so 80-20, no surprise there, pretty much the same as many of the other modules that we will study. The coursework, I think, we have covered already in quite a bit of detail. Questions, discussions, email is the way to get me, or phone or text messages. That's pretty much it as far as the administrative arrangements for the course are concerned. Um, before we move on to something a little bit more substantial, 
and that's last year's lecture, by the way. No Friday lecture slots, of course. Monday afternoon is when we meet. Before we go on to something a little more substantial, any questions about the sort of the admin arrangements for the course, or things like coursework, examinations, or so on? We all happy so far? Excellent. Superb. Right. Let us quite quickly then trot on with a brief introduction to the subject itself. So, control engineering, I'm very well aware, is a relatively new subject to most of us. It's not something that we've come across before. So what is it? What on earth is control engineering and why do we require all of our mechanical and all of our aerospace students to study it? And indeed, all of our brothers and sisters in electrical engineering. So whatever we learn in control engineering, they learn to a much greater extent in electrical engineering. Well, it's very, very simple. Um, in engineering, we harness systems, usually power systems, to do things for us. They might be the power of a nuclear reactor, for example, to boil water, generate steam, spin a turbine, produce electricity. It might be the power of a jet engine to drive an aircraft or a helicopter. Could be a whole range of things. It could be machine tools that we control. It could simply be, or it could be something as simple as controlling the speed of a car as it moves along the road. It could be a cruise control system. There are a vast number of examples of the use of power systems in engineering which we need to control without somebody standing there all of the time with a set of dials and control levers pressing up and down and trying to keep the system operating in the way that we want it to. That, in essence, is automatic control. It could be something as simple as maintaining the temperature in this room. That's an automatic control system. Maintaining the temperature in your flat or your accommodation, wherever you live, that's a control system. Some control systems are more complicated than others, but in essence, they all do the same thing. They are a way for us to control the output of a process so that the output is actually where we want it to be. Will it be there perfectly? Can we achieve perfection? Well, no, but that is important to us in understanding how much of a deviation we're prepared to accept compared with what the reference value might be. So if we set our motor vehicle cruise control, for example, to 100 kilometers per hour, would it be the end of the world if we were to travel at 101 or at 99? Probably not. Are those two things equivalent? Is a plus one kilometer per hour error just the same as a minus one kilometer per hour error? Actually, most of the time the answer is yes, but sometimes the answer is no. So if we are trying to maintain our vehicle speed at a speed limit, there is no consequence particularly for us drifting low in speed but there could be quite a severe penalty for drifting too high in speed. So quite often the error between where we want to be and where the system actually puts us is not symmetrical. It can be very highly asymmetrical. If you're trying to judge the position of the edge of a cliff, then the consequences of getting that wrong are very asymmetrical. If you stop a meter before the edge of the cliff, all is well. A metre too far the other way, very severe consequences. So some control systems or some examples of the application of control systems, actually the error or the result of the error, the consequences of the error, are actually quite symmetrical. It really doesn't matter. If the temperature in this room was set for 18 Celsius and it happened to drift up to 19 or it happened to drift down to 17, well, A, so what, but B, there wouldn't be a big consequence if we overshot the reference point 
or undershot the reference point. And a great many examples are like that. It doesn't really matter if we over, overstep the mark or understep the mark. But in some cases, it really does. It's critical that we, we allow a tolerance to the error, but that tolerance is bounded. We can't go one side of the line. We can go the other side. Okay. That has quite a consequence on how we design our systems and how we analyze them. Let's have a quick look at some of these systems or some of these terms that are on the slide. So I'm talking here about things called open loop control, closed loop control, block diagrams, and some examples of controllers. So what do I mean by all of those things? So introduction's fairly easy. There's our definition of control. So I've given the example here of a, a cruise control system in a car. That system can be very simple, but generally in today's vehicles, they're rather complicated. The constant speed is achieved by automatically adjusting, yes, perhaps the flow of fuel to the engine, but actually in most current car engine management systems, we introduce control over a range of different parameters, not necessarily just the rate at which fuel is introduced into the engine. We actually measure a whole bunch of other parameters as, as well. So even for something that's relatively straightforward, like a cruise control system in a car, the actual number of measurements we make and the way that the control system actually operates can be surprisingly complicated. Not always, but they can be quite complicated. So what do we mean by a control system? OK, a system in which the components are connected in such a manner as to regulate the system itself or something that it's attached to. So the control system, for example, might be the thermostat on this wall. But the thing we're actually trying to control is not the thermostat itself. It's the temperature of the room. The input to the system, sometimes we call it the excitation, but more, more usually the input, is the stimulus that's applied to the system itself. So if the room temperature is precisely where we want it to be, then the input to that system would actually be zero. There is no error between where we are and where we want to be. So the system will not act. It won't take action, generally speaking. There are slightly more complicated areas where, where it will, but as a snapshot in time, that would be an example of where the system does nothing. We are exactly where we want to be. The output to the system, fairly obviously, is the response, <clears throat> either directly or in terms of the thing that we're trying to control. If it was a thermostat on the wall, the thermostat might control, for example, the current that is sent to electrical heaters. If the temperature is too high, it might control the voltage that is sent to a motor that controls the air conditioning system in the room. The response to those two things, even if actually we don't care whether the temperature fluctuates upwards or downwards, the physical response of the system could be very, very different. So it might be that it's much quicker to heat up a room than it is to cool it. So we might get a very asymmetric response to a variation in where we actually are, which might be the temperature of the room, and where we want to be. Even if we are one degree C too high or one degree C too, too low, the rate at which we can correct that error might itself not be symmetric. Cruise control systems in cars, for example, generally take a dynamic action in only one direction. It sounds slightly odd. Anybody care to speculate what I might mean by that? So let's suppose that we were traveling either five kilometers an hour too high in speed or five kilometers an hour too low in speed. What action do you think that control system might 
um, might give to the motor in the car? Please. Very good, excellent. So, taking the, the previous example that we had, if we are traveling too fast, we could suppose that if it's an internal combustion engine, that the rate of delivery of fuel to the engine might be reduced in order to reduce our speed. If we're traveling too slow, that rate at which the engine receives fuel might increase, okay? But those two things don't necessarily have a symmetrical response. In one case, if we need to accelerate, the system is doing something dynamic. We are increasing the rate of, at which fuel is fed to the engine, the engine develops more power and torque, and accelerates the vehicle in a dynamic way up to the speed that we want. But if we think about it the other way around, if we're going too fast, if you're the driver, if it's a human driver, you have the option of very quickly reducing speed, which has nothing to do with the accelerator. You've got the option of applying the brake. Generally, cruise control systems don't work that way. They will accelerate, they will introduce additional power and torque to the engine if we're going too slow, but if we're going too fast, all they do is just cut the power and gradually the vehicle will lose speed because of uh, losses due to air friction and road friction, air friction mostly. So the rate at which those two corrections take place can be quite different. An actual acceleration due to the introduction of more fuel can occur quite quickly. But if we're going, let's say, five or 10 kilometers an hour too quickly, and we just effectively take our foot off, or the system takes its foot off the accelerator, it's a much more gradual response to get down to the speed that we want. So even though the system is controlling the same engine, the response to an overspeed and an underspeed can be quite different, simply because of the characteristics of the way that the engine behaves. Okay, a dynamic system is said to be dynamic if the output varies with time. In other words, like most of the problems that concern ourselves with in engineering, if it's a time-dependent problem, the system is dynamic. Almost all, not quite all, but almost all of the control problems that we encounter in this unit will be dynamic problems. They will change with time. We'll be interested in controlling properties that change with time. And systems can be, and this is complicated, open loop or closed loop. What on earth do we mean by that? Well, actually, they're fairly straightforward. An open loop system is a very simple system. It's one where we control some input parameter. Usually, it's just one input parameter. It could be several, but usually, it's just one. We set that parameter at the beginning of the process, and then we take a step back and just let the process do its thing. And we get an output. So a really good example of this process, at least for me, I've got a really simple toaster. It's just got a timer on it. You twizzle the timer. You get the time that you want. I set that process going, and the toaster does its thing. Maybe it's toasting the bread for a minute, 60 seconds, let's say. That toaster takes no account whatsoever on whether my bread is fresh or several days old, whether it's brown bread, white bread, or something in the middle, whether the bread has come straight from the freezer or not. It takes no account whatsoever. Everything that goes into that toaster gets the 60 seconds. And when the toaster pops up, you get what you get very, very similar to a microwave oven. You set the time, press go, and what you get out of the back of the process is what you get out. The toaster, the microwave oven, at least my toaster and microwave ovens, 
don't attempt to do any kind of monitoring through the process itself. They're not constantly measuring the temperature of the bread, measuring the temperature of whatever it is I'm microwaving, and deciding somehow, whoa, that's enough, we're going to stop the process right here. No, nope. as soon as I've set that timer going, the whole process goes on for the entire length of time, and at the end of it, we get what we get. That is what we mean by an open-loop control system. Please. Yeah, absolutely correct. So the input to the system usually is based on a single parameter. Very often that parameter is time. doesn't have to be, but it very often is. We set that system input parameter right at the beginning of the process, and during the process itself, we don't change that parameter, and indeed there is no possibility of changing the parameter in a purely open loop system. We say the system, or we describe the system as being open loop, largely by comparison with the alternative, which is a closed loop system. So we're jumping ahead a little bit, but just by comparison, a closed loop system is one where we set the requirements for the process right at the beginning. We set the process going, and as the process proceeds, we measure what is coming out of the back of it. So that might be, for example, the temperature of this room. If we set the temperature of this room to a reference value of 18 Celsius, then a closed-loop controller would include a thermostat, which is constantly measuring the temperature in the room. And when the temperature reaches the value that we have chosen, then the controller takes some action. Either it turns off the heaters if the room is too cold, or it turns off the air conditioning if the room was too hot and we were coming down in temperature. So we are constantly, we take part, we initiate the process, the process takes place, and then we're measuring what comes out at the end of the process and we're using that measurement to feed backwards to the beginning of the process. In that way, we've got a closed control loop. In an open loop system, there's no feedback at all. We set the process going, and out the other end of it, we get what we get. And hopefully, that's somewhere close to what we want. But if it isn't, Hard luck. There's no way of modifying that process once we've initiated it, once the process has set off. Okay, that sounds very simplistic, but we know that such things exist because we've already described them. We've talked about toasters, microwave ovens, there are plenty of other examples. Why should we be satisfied with such a rudimentary system? Well, the answers are fairly straightforward. They are simple. Open loop control systems are very, very simple. If they're simple, generally speaking, that means there's less to go wrong. A good rule of engineering is that if something can go wrong, eventually it will go wrong. So open loop control systems are very simple to, to buy, very simple to operate. They don't need much Operation, operational skill, they don't need much maintenance, they don't go wrong very often. Because they're so simple, they're quite reliable, generally speaking. But the, the price you pay for that simplicity and that low cost is that they are relatively inaccurate. They're fine if you're doing the same thing under the same conditions with the same materials again and again and again. Under those circumstances, they're probably good enough. But if any of those things are changing, if the environment is changing, if the materials you're using are changing, and obviously 
if the results you want out of the process might change with time, then open loop systems are not a great idea. But they are simple and they are cheap and everybody likes simple and cheap, please. be a good, a, a good definition. We're actually going to come on to closed loop systems on the next slide. So, here we are. Closed loop systems. The input to the system could be very similar. Um, it's not necessarily that the input or the output changes, but fundamentally for a closed loop system, the thing that differentiates it from an open loop system is that once we've started the process going, we actually measure what we're getting out of it. So if it's room temperature, we're measuring the temperature of the room constantly. If it's the speed of a vehicle, we're constantly measuring the speed of a vehicle. If it's the output from a nuclear power station, we're constantly measuring that output and comparing it to the value that we actually want and we're taking some corrective action based on the difference between what we actually get from the system at that particular point and what we actually wanted in the first place. What we wanted in the first place is our reference value, our current measurement is where we are at the moment, and the difference between the two is the error, sometimes called the error signal. And that error signal is really important to us because we can use that error signal as a way of adjusting how the process works relative to where we want the process to be. And actually, that's a really good segue into the discussion on um, these things called PID controllers. Okay. So compared with an open loop system, closed loop systems are just the opposite. They're more complicated, they cost more money, not a huge amount necessarily, they range a lot in, in complexity, but generally speaking they're higher cost than open loop systems. Because they're more complicated, there's more to go wrong, so they, they are fundamentally less reliable, but generally they're more accurate. The chances of you getting what you want out of the system are much, much better if it's, a, if it's a closed loop system. So fundamentally, control systems are either open loop or they're closed loop. We could indeed. So the question was, could we improve not so much the reliability, but the effectiveness of the control system by the rate at which we measure what comes out of it? And the answer to that absolutely is yes. That is called the sampling rate. And all closed loop control systems are characterized or can be characterized by a sampling rate. That sampling rate is an important characteristic of being able to get what we want from the system. What sort of characteristics do you think might affect the sampling rate, how frequently we should measure what's coming out of the system. What do you think might be important in deciding that factor? They do, they do. Why? It's a very, very good point. Um, well, maybe you can fly off course, and, and probably that's not good either. 
absolutely right. I think you're, 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 you're absolutely spot on with, with what you're saying. Absolutely spot on. So, fundamentally, and, and this is nothing to do with control systems particularly, dynamic physical systems, in other words, systems whose values change with time, are often characterized or can be characterized by a time constant. A length of time taken for a particular amount of change to occur in that system. And it's that fundamental physical time constant that gives us some indication of how frequently we should measure the output of the system. So let me illustrate that with two very simple examples. Well, with two examples, one of which is very simple, the other not quite so simple. If we were concerned with changing the temperature of this room and we had available to us the, this wonderful university's heating and cooling systems, so what sort of time constant do you think might be associated with changing the temperature of this room by, let's say, 3 degrees C? How long do you think that might take? I think it could, but I think that a room of this volume of air, and particularly on the basis of the efficiency of the systems that this university employs, I, I'd be more inclined towards the hourish, certainly tens of minutes. Tens of minutes, probably, to effect a three degrees C temperature change in this room. The Eurofighter aer aircraft is designed to be aerodynamically unstable in such a way that actually, without the onboard flight systems, a pilot would be unable to control that aircraft and it would crash. What sort of characteristic time period do you think is associated with the flight control systems for a fast jet aircraft. One, I, if I was a designer, I'd say the, the time between different samples. I hope, I'm sorry if this ends up being too long a time period, but I'd say around one fiftieth of a second. Good answer. I mean, fundamentally, much less than a second, yeah? probably less than a tenth of a second, maybe of the order of somewhere between one hundredth and one tenth of a second, bearing in mind that the things we are trying to control are the flight control surfaces, the flaps and so on, and they are mechanical systems and they will not respond on that time order. The control system has to respond on that time order, but in order to effect meaningful changes in the physical characteristics of the flight control surfaces of the aircraft, we are looking at perhaps half a second maybe to effect a substantial change in those flight control surfaces. But the flight control system must be able to, to react on a much faster time scale than that. So for a fast jet aircraft, we are talking about a loop sampling rate comparing what the system is doing with what we want the system to be doing with a time constant of much less than a second. Probably tenths of a second, maybe even faster than that. For something like controlling the temperature of this room, we are talking about tens of minutes. Hundreds, probably tens of thousands of seconds by comparison. So that loop rate, that sampling rate that we employ for closed loop systems can vary enormously depending on the physical characteristics of the system that we're trying to control. It also depends very, very much on the consequences of getting it wrong. Getting the temperature of this room wrong by a few degrees C, pretty small consequences. Getting the, the attitude control of a fast jet aircraft wrong, 
fairly large consequences. So it really does matter uh, about the, the physical time constraints of the system itself, the time constant of the system itself, and it also matters what the consequences are of us getting too large an error between where we want the system to be and where the system actually is. So consequences matter and the fundamental physical characteristics of the system itself also matter. We've gone a little bit further than I was intending to in these introductory slides, but it's all good stuff. This is material that we would encounter anyway and will encounter in the lectures coming up. Um, let me do a quick time check and see where we are. Okay, it's a little after four o'clock. I said there was probably not going to be a requirement for us to take a vote this afternoon, but actually I think that there is. I'm not proposing to go any further on these introductory slides. It's very, very simple-minded stuff. We've pretty much covered it already. I would be perfectly content for us to draw a line under the afternoon's proceedings here. However, I'm equally content for us to make a start on that description of PID controllers in order to give you a slight head start on your coursework. It is not the last time we will talk about PID controllers, absolutely not, but I'm very happy to flip, uh, to quickly trot through the slides this afternoon just to allow those of you who want to make an early start on the coursework to be able to do that. Um, I'm not going to decide this for you. I'm going to take, it, take a vote. So, those of you who've had enough and would like to make a hasty exit, let's see a show of hands. I applaud you for your honesty. Thank you. And just to make sure that um, we actually understand the question, those of you who'd like to make a fairly quick start on the PID control slides, so that we can make a start on coursework. And finally, those who didn't understand the question or, or were asleep. <laughs> All right, let's make a quick start on the PID slides. If anybody needs to shoot off at this point, please do so, but don't disturb too much your, your comrades. Okay, guys, um, let's make a quick start on this subject. I will come back to it next week, uh, just by, by, by way of a recap. Actually, that's usually how I start most of my lectures. We'll have a quick recap of what we talked about the week before, and then a quick introduction of what we're going to talk about this week. Um, PID controller sounds dreadfully complicated. It stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Controllers. Wow. Really scary stuff. Actually, no. No, 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 no. They are dead simple. Really, really simple. If you go out into industry, and I hope that most of you will, and you get at least peripherally involved in control systems, which a great many of you will, some of you will manage to avoid them throughout your entire working career, most of us come across them at some point or other, there is about a 99.99% probability that the control systems you will come across will be some type of PID controller. They might not be the full thing, P and an I and a D, but they will be some element, some variation on a PID controller. So, first of all, let's remind ourselves of 
what open and closed loop controllers are and, and talk about these things called block diagrams. So for an open loop controller, life is very, very simple. We have an input to the system, we have the system itself, and we get some kind of output from the system. And there's no feedback at all between what we get out from the system and what we put into it. In the case of our very simple toaster, what would be the input to the system? What do we put into a toaster? Right, so loads of things there. Um, most of those things are what we would call environmental conditions. Okay, The one input that we put into our toaster is time. It's a timing device. That's all it is. Just the same as your microwave oven, okay? We dial up a time, we press go, and we get what we get. What we put into the microwave oven or the toaster, what the ambient conditions are on the outside, all of those are environmental conditions. They affect the outcome, but they are not themselves what we put into the problem. What we put into the problem for an open loop controller, toaster, microwave oven, is time, and we get what we get out of it. We make no attempt to monitor the process as it takes place, and there is no possibility of any feedback between what we get out and what we put into the system. So that's our open loop controller. Very simple, very straightforward, but no possibility of actually controlling anything apart from in a very, very superficial way. An example of a closed loop controller might be room temperature. So this particular example is from the cabin of an aircraft, but it's the same sort of thing. We have a set point. The thing that we want out of the problem is a set temperature. We feed that through a controlling device of some sort. That controller might control the current that goes into electrical heaters. So we have a heating system. That heating system will produce an output the output is temperature. The thing we're interested in is temperature. In a closed-loop control system, we will measure that temperature using a sensor, and we will compare that measured temperature to the reference value that we actually want. And either we will be below the reference or above the reference. And that difference between what we actually want and where we actually are that difference is the error. And it's the error signal that PID controllers make use of. So fundamentally, the error signal is the difference between where we want to be and where we actually are at the moment. And that error, which can be positive or negative, we can actually make use of that error in nudging the system back to where we want it to be. And that is fundamentally what a PID controller does, or a closed loop controller does. So our control problem here is, as set out here, how can we ensure that the actual temperature reaches the desired temperature as quickly as possible, and ideally doesn't overshoot, it stays there, it stays at what its reference value is. So recall, well, recall from about five seconds ago that we define the error as the difference between the current temperature and the target. So we can define the error, and remember that's a function of time, it will change dynamically, as the difference between the actual temperature that we're measuring and the temperature that we want. If the error is large and negative, then that means that we are substantially below the temperature that we actually wanted. In that case, we might require the heaters to start working very, very quickly. So the heaters would operate at maximum capacity. If the error is very large and positive, that means the actual temperature is much higher than where we want it to be. Assuming that the aircraft is fitted with chillers, 
then we would turn on the chiller units to bring that temperature down as quickly as possible to where we want it to be. It might not be. It might be that we simply have the same problem that we have with a cruise control system in a car. In other words, we can heat up the cabin quite quickly, but if we want it to, the temperatures to reduce, we might just turn off the heaters and wait for heat to leak out into the surrounding atmosphere. That would be an example of a system where we get a much faster response in one direction than we do in the other direction. But let's suppose our cabin has both heaters and chiller units available. If the error is large and negative, then the heaters will come on. And if the error is very large, we want to turn up the heaters as quickly as we can to warm the cabin up quickly. And similarly, if the error is large and positive, in other words, we are way over the temperature that we want, then we want the chillers to operate at maximum capacity. And if the error is zero, then we don't want either of those two things to work. And that forms the basis of the first part of a proportional integral derivative controller, this idea that we can not just use the error itself, but the magnitude of the error to control how quickly we respond, or the system responds, to bring the reference value to where we actually want it to be. So if the system has an output, let's call it the controller output, or CO, then we could set the system to be such that our reference, our reference point for the output is given by the reference plus some measure of the error times a constant. So fundamentally, if we have a large error, we want the system to react in a way that is proportional to the size of the error. If the error is big, we want the system to react quickly. If the error is quite small, then we don't want the, the system to put the heaters on full because we will overshoot. Instead of being at a temperature which is a little bit too low, all of a sudden we'll be at a temperature that's way too high. So if the error is that we've got a temperature that's below where we want it to be, we want the response of the system to be proportional to the error. If the error is small, we want our correction to be small. If the error is big, we might need to make a big correction. If you're steering a car down a road and you're a little bit off target, if you're slightly drifting to the left or diff drifting to the right compared with where you want to be, you don't suddenly jam the steering wheel one way or jam it the other way to make a massive correction. You make a gentle correction because your error is really only quite small. If for some reason you drop off at the wheel, wake up, and you find that you're way out of lane, yeah, make a really big correction, make it quickly. So the size of the correction that we make is proportional to the size of the error. Make sense? That's it. We are a third of the way through proportional integral derivative controllers. We've done the proportional bit. That's all it is. The size of the system response is just proportional to the size of the error. Big error, big response. Little error, just a small response, because if we made it any bigger, we would undershoot or overshoot quite rapidly. Okay, that's it. That's the proportional bit of PID controllers. A great many controllers in industry and around the house, or domestic settings are actually just proportional controllers. For many, many situations, that's complicated enough. That's all we need. We need a, all we need is a controller that tries to make an adjustment that's dependent on the size of the error. Okay? That's it for proportional controllers, pretty much. That constant of proportionality, by the way, KP, is just called the proportional gain. We have a proportional gain, an integral gain, and a derivative gain. 
and by tuning the size of those individual parameters, we can tune how, the, how our controller overall will behave for any particular problem. If the proportional gain is very large, what do you think that that would imply about the sensitivity of our control system? High sensitivity, yeah? So if the proportional gain is very large, that means that wherever we have an error, that error gets multiplied by a big number and our system corrects very, very quickly. If we are interested in very, very rapid correction, that could be a good thing. What do you think might be the negative consequences of a very, very large proportional gain? Please. Yes. Yes. Ab absolutely true. Absolutely. Um, all of these references to critical damping, under damping, over damping, it's late in the afternoon, don't concern yourselves too much with them, but it's absolutely right. This subject about the rapidity of the response and whether the response oscillates with time, these are very, very closely related to the damping problem and the calculation of damping ratio. We won't address this next week or the week after, but as the module proceeds, we will come across these concepts, okay? But for now, all we need to know is that if that proportional gain is very large, the system response will be very rapid, but that could be too rapid. We can easily get the system overshooting and then undershooting and constantly trying to correct itself as it overshoots, undershoots, overshoots, undershoots, and we get this oscillatory behavior that wobbles between overshooting, undershooting, overshooting, undershooting, and we never quite get to the reference value. We get more than it, less than it, more than it, less than it. That's not often the type of behavior that we want. Please. I'm so sorry, I didn't get that. Is it? Is it being inaccurate was the question. Um, depends what we want from the system itself. Um, it's a little bit like a stopped clock. A stopped clock will be perfectly right twice a day. And so will, so will our oscillatory behavior. Every time we cross the zero line, we'll be spot on, but only momentarily, and then we'll be too low. And then we'll come up again, and we'll be spot on just momentarily, and then we'll be too high. So usually this kind of oscillating behavior is not what we want at all. It doesn't give us exactly the behavior we want. It's just wobbling around between overshooting and undershooting. Yes, we, are, we will be momentarily correct every time we go across the x-axis, but normally that's not what we want. Depends on the system. Um, much better generally to have a system that approaches very, very quickly the reference value and then stays there, doesn't oscillate around, okay? So that selection of the gain is quite important. If the gain is too slow, the system will be really, really slow in responding. It will get there, but it will get there very slowly, and maybe that's not quickly enough. If it's too large, it will get there very, very quickly, but usually it will overshoot. It will go too high and then too low and then too high. We don't usually want that either. Somewhere in the middle, there will be a good version of gain that's about right for this system. So that's proportional control in a nutshell. Very, very simple idea. And there's a, a quick graphic that has been 
shamelessly stolen from Wikipedia that illustrates what we mean. If the actual system itself undergoes this blue step change from a value at just less than 0.1 up to a new value of around about 1, then the three different lines illustrate the values of different KP. So KP of 1.6 corrects itself very, very quickly, but overshoots and then undershoots and then overshoots and undershoots, and eventually we get where we want to be, but only after several oscillations. The red line, on the other hand, with a very low value of KP, that doesn't oscillate, but it takes a long, long time to get up to where we want the new system reference point to be. So it's quite slow behavior. The ideal behavior might be closer to the green line, where we get a very small overshoot, and then we rapidly approach the new reference value. So that's a sort of a, a graphic illustration of what changing KP might, might do to us. Limitations, well, we've sort of described these already. If KP is very large, the system will respond rapidly, but will tend to overshoot. And if the system, if KP is too, too slow, then we get this very, very slow, we call it sluggish behavior. And generally, we're trying to look for a compromise of the two. If the conditions where the reference point were determined change, so for example, if we're trying to set the temperature of this room and we use one set of conditions, maybe it's today, to tune that value of Kp to get a really, really good response for the temperature of this room, we might conceivably get a very, very different dynamic response in January when the temperature outside might be freezing. It's quite warm today. But in January, we might get a very, very different response to a change in the heating value for this room. So the question is, how can we recognize and how can we take into effect changes in the environmental condition in which our system operates. And the solution very often is to take account of not just the instantaneous error, in other words, the error right now between where we want the temperature to be and where the temperature actually is, wouldn't it be interesting, though, if we could look backwards over time and see how that error was changing over time? And maybe that would give us a better way to control the error already that we're uh, applying today in order to get back to that set point as quickly as we can. And that's the way that the next term actually works. So the integral term is based not on the size of the error right now, but on the size of the error summated over some period of time going backwards in time. What should that period of time be? Well, it really depends on the nature of the system we're trying to control, going back to this idea of time constants that we mentioned a little earlier. If we were interested in looking at the behavior of the error over a period of time that is relevant to the temperature of this room, then as we heard already, probably the relevant period of time that we might be interested in is going to be measured at least in tens, if not hundreds of minutes. If we're interested in the error on the flight control surfaces of a fast jet, the relevant time period might be measured in a few seconds the seconds that you can count on the fingers of one hand, probably. So that time interval over which we summate the errors really depends on the dynamics of the system that we're trying to control. Some systems are just characteristically slow, like the temperature change in this room. Others are extremely rapid, like changing the flight control surfaces in a fast jet aircraft. Most of them are somewhere in the middle. So the integral term 
looks very much like the proportional term, but rather than having a, a constant of proportionality multiplied by the current instantaneous error, instead, we take that constant of proportionality and we multiply it by some summation of the errors going back over a time period that's appropriate for the system that we're under consideration. And we call this the integral term. And again, we can draw ourselves some little sketches to see how the integral term changes or the response of the integral term changes relative to the value of ki. So if ki is very low, again, we get this sluggish response. We get to where we want to be eventually, but it's quite slow. If ki is too large, then we get a similar sort of behavior to that that we saw for the proportional error. In other words, yep, it's a very, very rapid change, very quick correction, but we overcorrect. And then we have to undercorrect and overcorrect. And eventually we get back to where we want to be, but it takes several oscillations to do that. And ideally, something like the green behavior, where ki, and in this case, K, kp and kd, are equal to one. That gives us a, a more optimized response. It's where we get to our reference value very quickly, but we don't under or overshoot many, many different times. So we've got a proportional term. We've got an integral term that's where the correction that we make doesn't depend on the instantaneous error, but on some kind of accumulation of error over time, the sort of the history of the error, if you like. And finally, if you hadn't worked it out already, we've got this thing called the derivative term. So the problem with proportional or proportional and integral controllers is that they are always fundamentally reactive. What I mean by that is we have to wait until an error has occurred. In other words, until the system set point and the point at which the system is actually operating at the moment are different. We can't apply any kind of control to the system until an error has occurred. And that seems fundamentally a limitation, yeah? We can't apply any control until things have gone wrong. And then we react to the fact that the system has, got, has gone wrong. So proportional and proportional integral controllers can only react to the fact that we've got an error. They can't anticipate an error. They can't see an error coming down the road and take corrective action before the error actually occurs. The derivative term is our rough and ready attempt to try and predict what is coming in terms of the size of the error. And all we do is simply take the first derivative of the error term with respect to time. So what this is doing is saying, well, okay, we might have an error that at a particular time is this big, but let's look not just at the magnitude of the error, let's look at the slope of the error with time. Is that error getting larger with time? Or is it getting smaller with time? If the error is naturally getting smaller with time anyway, then e even if right now, at this instant in time, even if we've got a particular error term, we might say to ourselves, well, actually, you know what? Yes, we've got this error right now, but when we look at the derivative term, that error is actually going to get smaller with time. So you know what? Maybe we don't need to make such a big correction because the error is naturally going to get smaller with time anyway. It's our way of kind of looking ahead and anticipating what, where the system might be going. Conversely, if we have only a small error right now, but the gradient of that error is getting much bigger with time, that's telling us that, well, okay, the error might only be quite small right now, but with time, it's going to get much bigger. So maybe what we need is a much bigger correction than we would get just from the proportional term. So this derivative term 
can in principle be quite a powerful tool. It allows us, at least in principle, to look forward in time and to anticipate not where the system is right now, but where the system might be in the future and to take some corrective action before we actually get there. Feels like it ought to be a really, really, really useful term. And in some systems, it is. It can be very useful. It does have some problems associated with it, though. Um, one is rather more fundamental. One is actually just quite practical. Um, the, practical the practical problem is that most of the things that we're trying to control, we need to measure. They might be temperature, they might be speed, they might be power output. We always need some kind of transducer to measure the thing that we're trying to measure. It might be temperature, whatever it is. And the problem with transducers is that they convert a physical quantity, which might be temperature, might be speed, might be something else, they convert that quantity into an electrical quantity, usually voltage. It doesn't have to be, but very often is voltage. So the way your car speed controller works is that it converts the current road speed into a voltage, and it compares that voltage towards a reference voltage, which represents the speed you want the car to be traveling at. And it's that voltage difference that gets fed into the control system. Okay, fine, so what? The problem with electrical systems, and particularly electrical transducers, things that convert physical quantities into electrical quantities, is that they can be susceptible to electrical noise. So I don't mean acoustic noise, I don't mean they're noisy, as in the sort of thing we hear with our ears, I mean that we can get electrical signals that are not clean. They have disturbance in them. Sort of a, like, like a seismic event on a, on a seis seismometer. The problem with that is that where you get electrical noise or interference in the case of an otherwise smooth signal, if you're trying to take the derivative of that signal then wherever you've got sharp electrical noise, the derivative suddenly goes off the scale. And you get the system trying to respond hugely to something that actually might only be a very small derivative signal. That's a practical problem. We can go some way to overcoming it. We can use filters, for example, electrical filters, to filter out some of these sharp noises but they are imperfect. We don't get them all. So on a practical level, de the derivative part of the controller can be susceptible to electrical interference or noise. Please. Is the derivative calculated numerically? And so the question was, is the derivative calculated numerically? Generally speaking, the answer is yes. So most control systems today are digital control systems. They don't have to be. There are many control systems in use, even today, that are analog systems. But increasingly, and not surprisingly, most systems are transitioning across to being digital controllers. So yes, the derivative term and the other terms are calculated numerically. So when you differentiate signal noise, that noise gets amplified, and that, that gives the system uh, the, or that can lead to the system becoming unstable. The other more fundamental limitation to simply differentiating the error signal is that we can get a little bit carried away with the ability of our controller to predict the future. This is not really a controller that understands what's going on and is, in, and is able in any meaningful way to predict the future, it's not at all. We're just differentiating an error signal. This is a fundamentally a very simple controller. The only thing that we're operating on, the only characteristic of this system that we're actually operating on is the size of the error signal. Our controller does not know anything about the system 
that it's controlling. It could be the temperature of a room, it could be the temperature of a fridge, it could be an F-35 fighter jet. The PID controller has no idea what it's controlling. And there, fundamentally, lies the limitation of PID controllers. It's not in any way a substitute for a physical model of the system itself. A physical model, at least a, a, a high fidelity physical model, will tell us much, much more about the system itself and would be much, much more reliable as a means of predicting where the system might go in the future. But it is way more costly, complex, prone to error. And actually, if we want to buy a controller off the shelf and use it for a whole variety of different control applications, then it would be a real pain to have to develop complicated physical models for every different application that we wanted to use it for. And in most cases, just isn't necessary. So the great advantage of a PID controller is actually its simplicity. But we should never forget that simplicity. It's a really simple controller. It does not know anything about the system it's trying to control. It's simply working on an error signal. Either the instantaneous value of that signal, which is the proportional bit, some kind of accumulation of the error over time, which is the integral bit, or some approach to trying to anticipate where that error might be going in future, which is the derivative bit. Please. So sorry, my hearing's a bit rubbish. A physical model. So what do I mean by a physical model? So if we wanted to physically model, for example, um, an internal combustion engine to driving the car that you're trying to control the speed of, okay? Well, let's do this the other way around. Let's suppose we have a vehicle and you want to control the speed of that vehicle. With a PID controller, you would simply need to measure one thing, and that is the current speed of the vehicle. You would use something called a TACO generator, which we will meet in a few lectures' time, to convert the actual road speed into an electrical voltage, and we could compare that electrical voltage, which represents current actual speed, with the intended speed that you want the car to travel at, and that would give us a voltage difference. And it's that voltage difference that the PID controller makes use of and uses to feed back into the engine management system either to put more fuel into the engine or reduce the amount of fuel that's going into the engine. So it's a very, very simple system. We are only measuring one physical quantity. A physical model of the internal combustion engine and the car itself would have to take into account the calorific value of the fuel that we're putting into the engine. It would have to take into account the thermodynamic properties of the air that we're feeding into the combustion process. We'd have to understand from a thermodynamic point of view how much energy we're getting every time an explosion takes place in the cylinders. We'd have to understand the dynamic performance of the engine itself. In other words, how quickly or slowly does the engine react to a change in the power output from the engine itself. We'd have to understand the effects of the environmental conditions that the engine is working on. So is the car going uphill? Is it going downhill? Is it going into a headwind? Is there a tailwind? There's no end of physical characteristics that actually have an influence on how quickly that car will proceed down the road given a certain amount of fuel injected into the engine. A physical model, a good physical model, would take into account all of those variables. It would allow us to have a much better idea between the amount of fuel that goes into the engine and the final road speed. 
but it would be an incredibly complicated model. Very difficult to develop, quite difficult to maintain, prone to change over time because as engines age, all of those parameters would drift over time. Our simple PID controller only needs to know one thing. How fast are we going? How fast do you want to go? Simple. So as a way of controlling the car speed to a super degree of accuracy, probably not as good as a physical model. As a way of doing it quickly, cheaply, and easily, perfectly good. Does that make sense? In essence, guys, that is a PID controller. If we want to take full value of all the different terms, all we do, excuse me, all we do is add them together. Um, there are two ways of adding them together, either in parallel, this is called the non-interacting form or the ideal form, so we get an error signal coming from the difference between the reference process and what we feed into the, the controller, that gives rise to an error. That error signal is used to calculate the three independent bits of the controller, the proportional term, the integral term, and the derivative term. They all get added together in some way. That's a simple summation block. And that total controller response gets fed into the process that we're trying to control, and we get some new outputs from the process. That process gets sampled, so that might be speed, for example, so we measure the speed, and we feed that back into the process, and now, hopefully, we've got a smaller error term. And the whole thing just goes round and round and round until that error term has been reduced to zero. Uh -huh. That's right. A sigma is just a summation. It's a, a, an uppercase sigma is usually used as an indication for summation. So we add together the three parts of the, of the controller, the proportional part, the integral part, and the derivative part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the ideal or the non-interacting form of PID controllers. The one that we actually use in industry is a little bit different. It looks like that. Typically, we have the proportional term appearing at the beginning, and then we have the integral and derivative and potentially a direct feed term going directly. Why do we do this in industry? Why is this different from the ideal or the non-interacting term? It's really simple. In most industrial applications, the term that is dominant that we make the most use of is the proportional term. That's much bigger than the other two terms. Very often, the other two terms are not present at all. If they are, they're usually quite small. So one of these terms is usually dominant. It's the proportional term. And if the configuration is in this way, it's a little bit lazy, but once we've set up the controller initially, if we want to make adjustments through life, the only parameter that we have to change around is the proportional controller, the KP term. That's all we do, yes. So that's an optional term. That is called, called a feed-forward loop. And that's just taking the error signal and not changing it at all just feeding that forward into the process. Not all controllers have that loop. It's optional. It's a feed-forward loop, yeah. I'm not quite sure I'm following you, but 
we'll pick this up on, on future weeks, okay? You've been very good. Thank you for your attention so far this afternoon. Before you go, guys, before you go, please do at least have a look at the PID pages on Wikipedia. If you can make a start, please do so. Remember how to contact me if you need me, and I will look forward to seeing you next week.